Good morning. It's time to get started. We, we'd like to welcome you all to Fairview. There are visitors here. Glad, glad to see y'all here. And if y'all will stay after service to let us get to know you. Um, we're In a few moments, we're about to break for class. But before we do that, our brother Sam Edwards will lead us in our opening prayer. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for all our many blessings. We thank you for this beautiful day that we can come here and learn more about you. Father, we ask as we go through this, this Sunday school and service, as we say and do things according to you, according to your will. Father, we ask that you please just help the sick people, help the ones that are not here, and bring them back to better health. Father, uh, please be with the ones that are deal fighting cancer and dealing with those treatments, Father. We ask that you please be with the ones that have lost loved ones and be with them and comfort them as all as you can. Just be with us now. Go through us. Go through this service with us, Father, and forgive us for all the many sins. And thank you for your son. And in his name we pray. Amen. Hello. 
Good morning. What a beautiful day, huh? I see some have their family with them today and came down to visit. We are so glad that you're here. I'm a little tired, to be honest with you. I walked about 50,000 steps through Opryland Hotel the last two nights. But man, I tell you what, it was a great weekend. It was really a good weekend. I'm so proud of all those who were involved with our Lads to Leaders program. Uh, some of our lads didn't go to the convention, but they were still involved in other events and did very well. And um, everybody who went and competed did great. And it was just an uplifting day. It really was. Fairview was well represented at this uh, convention. And um, the kids or the children are already looking forward to next year and saying what they can't wait to try and, and things like that. So I, I'm, I'm really uplifted by all of that. So just wanted to make that mention. I'm, I'm so grateful for those um, who set everything up and I'm thankful for our elders to allow us uh, to do that. And also that that's a perfect segue to pull a plug uh, or put in a plug for the spiritual lectureship. Speaking of Fairview rep representation, um, these spiritual lectures are in Rogersville, Alabama at the Cedar Grove Congregation. It'll be Saturday, April the 13th, so it's a week from this Saturday. And if you have plans, or if you don't have plans, I, I hope you make plans to go to this. Uh, several of ours uh, are speaking at this lectureship, and several of ours are leading in prayers, reading scriptures, and song leading and things like that. But that the theme is building the Lord's church for the future. And uh, I'm really, really excited about that. And we have several brochures up here if you want to read more about that. Okay. By the way, I'm still the preacher here at Fairview. I know it's been a long time. I was 41 years old the last time I spoke in this building. And now I'm 42. So I don't know how that happened, but there you go. March 10th was the last time we... Uh, studied 1 Corinthians 10, and that's where we are, 1 Corinthians 10. And I'll begin with a, with a simple question. You already know the answer to this, or at least I'm confident that you know the answer to this. Is it possible for one who had obtained salvation to lose that salvation, yes or no? Absolutely. And if there's anyone who has that conversation with you, lovingly show them and study and observe 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Because Paul uses, we're going to kind of do a review since it, it's been three weeks. We had David saying and then gospel meeting and now me again. Uh, Paul uses an example of those who lived uh, in, in the previous or in the old, old dispensation, how they were saved by God how God had provided them all that they need for salvation, and yet they still fail. Okay, if you remember. Uh, so let's, by way of review, let's, let's begin at verse 1 and just briefly discuss this, and then we'll continue on with our study in verse 13. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant, how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Of course, you know, we're actually studying that tonight in Exodus chapter 13. How God appeared before them uh, in the pillar of smoke or a cloud and by fire. And he guided them uh, through their journey and how they divided the Red Sea and all safely passed through that. Here you go, sister. <laughs> um, but also, let me give another background as far as 1 Corinthians 10. Remember, there are those who were weak and those who were strong when it con uh, considering eating or consuming meat that were offered to idols. OK, there were some um, who were weak, who had converted out of the paganism. And so to partake in consuming that meat, that would bother their conscience. And then we have those who are supposedly strong, who are uh, taking advantage of their Christian liberties, if you will. And saying, well, this is nothing. Paul already told them that eating and consuming that meat is nothing, depending on certain circumstances. If they 
ate that meat in front of the weak brother, that would cause a stumbling block. That would cause a stumbling block uh, for that weak brother. They could also influence the weak brother uh, to consume the meat. And that would, again, bother his conscience. Shouldn't do that. But they take it a step further. And again, he talks about that this in this chapter. They were actually partaking in, maybe not intending to, but still by appearance, partaking in the pagan worship by going to these temples and eating these this meat. That's where the sin comes in. OK. All right. So that's the background. People aforetime. I would not have you ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. They, they had God's protection. They were under God's protection, yet they fell. They were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So when they crossed the Red Sea, they had waters on both sides, right? And they had the cloud above them. They were immersed. They were overwhelmed. But yet they still fail. Um, continue as we read. Uh, and did all eat the same spiritual meat. All right. They were fed by God. And these people fail. Check this out. And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock. Notice the rock is capitalized here. That followed them, and that rock was who? Christ. Christ was literally with them. And these aforetime had fallen. Here's how they fell. Verse 5, But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they have lusted. So they fell through lust. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. So they fell through lust. They fell through idolatry. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. So they fell through uh, uh, fornication as well. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of the serpents. So fail, uh, they fell through failure to overcome temptation to test God. Uh, neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Uh, they Some died directly due to the power of God because they murmured. Number 16, Korah gathered a following and rebelled against Moses, right? God's servant. They didn't like. They criticized how Moses was leading. But he's still God's servant. They're murmuring. They're complaining. So they fell through murmuring. Verse 11, now all these things happened unto them for an example in samples, and they are written for our admonition. What does that mean, admonition? Warning. They were written for our warning upon whom the ends of the world are come. Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for what? Our learning, Romans 15, 4. Okay? I, I'm so thankful that, that God did not hide or perceive that we didn't need to know the shortcomings of the people aforetime. I'm thankful and grateful to read about that, to know that, hey, if I follow in that path, I'm not going to be pleasing to God. Also, in the sense, um, there are those who've fallen short, but have overcome and found God's grace. I'm Happy to read about that. That's encouraging to me. Because what does that mean? We could, yeah, y'all are really quiet. That kind of concerned me a little bit. Hey, we're, we were in our sins. Christ died for us, right? He bled so that we could be saved, right? We can overcome our sinful living. That does not mean that we can continue in living in that way. Right. Some people will get in the water and say, well, my ticket to heaven's punched back to life. And they go right back to their old way of living. Well, that right here is what Paul's talking about. 
You can't go back to your old way of living. We're now raised with Christ. That's my sermon this morning. Okay. We're raised with Christ and we live according to his ways, because if we don't, what's going to happen to us? Exactly what we just read through. We could fall. If we couldn't fall, why warn us? Right. But that's important. That's important. I mean, Peter tells us it's much worse if we have known the way, right, and obtained salvation and then lose it. Can you imagine how much worse that punishment would be? Why would that be worse? What? Just speculate. Imagine how worse that punishment would be. Oh, me. What you had and you lost it. Imagine being in torment and saying and thinking to yourself, I, I, I don't, it's my fault that I'm here. And I had, I had a chance to go to paradise. I had a chance to go to heaven. But I, I don't know how else to say this, but we will spend every nanosecond, which to us, eternity will feel like 10,000 years, telling ourselves, I had it all, right? So there you go. There, this is an admonition. This is our warning. They are our warning, okay? <laughs> so look at verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he what? Well, wait a minute. Once saved, always saved, right? If you've obtained salvation, there's no way you'll lose it. Show them verse 12 of chapter 10. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Conveniently, right? Conveniently. They leave that out. Well, what do they say then? Well, if you fail, then you would never obtain salvation in the first place. Well, how could I fall if I've never obtained salvation in the first place? Right. How can I fall if I'm not already standing? How can I lose grace if I didn't have it before? Right. So, yes, we most certainly can lose our salvation. And that's only our fault. So we need to be careful with these liberties. But here's, here's, a, here's some uh, encouragement here. Look at verse 13. <clears throat> there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. No temptation is overtaken you that is not common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to what? That you may be able to bear it. Here's encouragement. By the way, that, that what you're going through, it's very common. Everybody's going through it. The temptations people are facing, everybody's facing temptations. The problems that you're facing, everybody's facing those kinds of problems. But God's faithful. He'll provide a way for you to escape. All right, you've heard me say this before, that how some people abuse this verse. Have you ever heard somebody, or maybe somebody said this to you, or maybe you've said this to somebody else with good intentions? God will never give you more than you can handle. Have you ever heard that saying before? That is an evil saying. Some people will say that as a, as they're, they're thinking that it's a good, what well, the, the intention's good to, to provide comfort. Don't worry, it's so bad that God will not throw anything else on you. That's an evil saying if you're just learning this for the first time. What kind of God would we serve if he just pushes you all the way to the edge of the cliff and then just says, all right. That's not the God we serve. We serve a God who loves us and cares for us and provides for us. And what has he provided? A way to escape. Temptations are not unique. Everybody's facing them. Problems are not unique. Everybody is dealing with these things. But we remember that God is under control. 
We remember that he has provided a way to escape. We remember that God is still here. Sometimes that's when things are piling on. What do we, what is the tendency to do? Have you ever blamed God for your problems before? God, it's your fault. I wouldn't have done this if you didn't put that temptation in front of me. Yes, ma'am. Sure. Mm-hmm. And he's trying to bring me into some kind of temptation in his world, then if you're not strong enough, then you're full of fault. Well, God is, if you're living right, his spirit in you is going to help you to overcome that temptation. Let's go to James chapter 1. The difference here is the difference between give and allow. He's not going to give you the temptation. He's not going to give you the give and allow. That's a good point. Some will say and use that. Yeah, they'll use that as an excuse. Well, see, see the evil in this world? That's proof that God does not exist. On the contrary, it proves that He does. It proves that He does. He provides a way to escape out of that. That's right. Very, very good. Very good. Uh, Read with me beginning at verse 12. Blessed is the man that endures temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to him, to them that love him. Let no man say when, not if, but when he is tempted. I'm tempted of God. God did this. Well, we can't say that. Why? For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away by his what? Own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin when it is finished, it brings forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. The evil proves that God exists, but God doesn't send the evil. The evil comes from whom? Me. Not me by myself, y'all. Y'all looked at me like I was Satan. Every one of us could do this. That's where the evil comes from. Right? But what we do is we put His Word, the way to escape in our minds. Psalm 119, 11, Thy word have I hid in my what? And I'm pointing at my brain. Now, I'm not a poor biology student. I know this is my brain. And I know where my heart is. Somewhere right in this area, right? Somewhere here. I feel it pumping here. Right. Very good. This is your spiritual heart. This is just a muscle. This reacts to what goes in here. Okay? Everything reacts to what goes in here. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against me. So if we if we strive not to sin, if we do our best not to sin, if we remember that word, that provides a way of escape, doesn't it? Now, we do everything right. We do everything right. But the temptation still comes or the problem still arises. What then? You still have the word here. Now you can endure it. You can endure it. The strongest people I know sometimes are on their deathbed. Because their word, God's word is in their mind. 
And they know that when they draw their final breath, it's not the end for them, right? All of us, we're sitting there thinking, well, that'll be 20, 30, 40, 50. We don't know that, do we? But we have His Word in our mind. We can endure that fact. We're not scared in a sense that we're, what's next? We may be scared. It's okay to be scared. But we have God's Word in our mind. That's the way to escape. God is still here. Israel at Sinai thought that they were alone. How do I know that? Because they wanted to build an idol. <laughs> but they weren't alone, were they? God told Moses, uh, by the way, the people down there are acting foolish. God knows everything. We can't hide. Yeah. Excellent point. Another manifestation of God. You just look around in the room. Sometimes we there's some things that are so piled on we can't endure it by ourselves. We try. We try to do it all by ourselves. And we insist. And and, uh, and sometimes the, ch the church is desperate to help. We want to help. And yeah. Amen to that. It's 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 when people refuse the help, they are refusing God's help in a sense. Very good. You're robbing me. You're robbing me. You need the help, and I offer the help, and you say, no thanks. You just took my opportunity to serve God. How dare you? Desire. When you see the temptation, the desire comes. Lust doesn't just deal with sexual stuff. It's a desire to do anything. Sometimes I desire a chocolate donut. And I know that I shouldn't consume that. And I walk away maybe for a half a second, but then I turn around and see that donut looking at me. And then I'm enticed. I take that donut and I consume it. And then comes death afterwards. But right. I mean that's actually and that's a perfect segue to where I want to go next. Okay. The way to escape. Who do we need to follow? Who are we trying to imitate? Our Lord. Let's go to Matthew 4. Brother Raymond said, temptation of itself is not a sin. That's actually, that's 100% correct. That's 100% correct because if it was a sin, we'd have no Savior. <laughs> right? And so if you look at here at verse 1, then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterward, I could, I, could, I could imagine how hungry he must have been after 40 days and 40 nights of not eating. And when the tempter came to him, he said, if you're the son of God, he's being a smart aleck, if you're the son of God, command these stones to be made of bread. But he answered and said, and the underline every time you see this, it is what? Underline that. That's the way to escape. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of whom? God. 
Then the devil takes him up to the holy city, sets him up on the pinnacle of the temple, says unto him, if you're the son of God, cast thou down. Set. And look, the devil tries, tries to trick him. For it is written, the devil knows the book from cover to cover, everyone. Y'all know that, right? Our devil knows the book from cover to cover. He says, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest that any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. That's God's word. But he twisted it. He twisted it. Jesus said, it is what? It's written again. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again, the devil takes him up into an exceeding high mountain, shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and says, All these I will give if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Hey, could the devil do that? Could the devil give him the world? Yes, he could. Why? He's the prince of the world. How many people have sold their souls for things much less? All you have to do is turn on the news when people break in and steal about three pairs of Nikes out of a store. Imagine selling your soul for a pair of tennis shoes. There it is. Absolutely. And imagine being on a mountain. Y'all been to the mountains. Some of y'all been to the mountains, I'm, I'm sure. Or at least on a hill to where you can see afar all these beautiful cities afar. A brother lives on a hill, took me up that mountain, showed me the square, said, look over there. And it took my breath away. I was like, this is amazing. Because the view, we love views, don't we? This could be yours if you worship me. How many would do that? Nobody would know. I could keep it all to myself. I could worship him and nobody has to know that. I, I Look what I get. Verse 10. Jesus said, get thee hence, Satan, for it is what? <laughs> thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. You see, if we say nobody will know, that's not really true, is it? Because in the end, you may have that nice, beautiful house or whatever, the property or the kingdom's. In the end, after you draw your last breath, guess what you don't have? Those things that you saw are no longer yours. Or you could live until the Lord comes back and watch it burn. But that'll be consumed quicker than you can blink. So maybe you can't watch it burn, but I know this. All that stuff that you obtained because of your, your compromise is going to be your worst nightmare. It's going to be like ashes in your mouth. And you're saying and asking yourself, question yourself, why did I do that? Right? Esau, firstborn, should have had way more than his brother, right? And he traded it all for what? A <laughs> bowl of pottage. He hungry. His tummy was growling. And he gave everything up. Silliness, isn't it? All right, let's go back to 1 Corinthians 10. So what's our way of escape? What's our way of escape if we're, we're, we have temptation? What's our way of escape when things come down piling on top of us and we can no longer carry the load? What's our way of escape? Scriptures. It is what? Written. Written.
Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Beating yourself up. You beat yourself up and you're woke. Yeah. And you give up. You know what that is? Look at verse 14. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from what? Idolatry, what, what's that got to do with me? Everything. Everything. Verse 12 is a warning. Verse 13 is encouragement. Verse 14 is the way out. I... There's a tendency where I may feel, and again, I don't know. Sometimes it may go unnoticed, even from my own self. If I'm, if I'm, if I'm constantly beating myself down, and I'm separating myself from the Lord's body, and I'm constantly saying "Woe is me" or "Why me" or "This, this, and this," guess what that is? That's worship of self. And if I'm worshiping anything but the true and living God, what is that? That's idolatry. So here's the way out. Turn your backs and <laughs> fly. Book it. Have you ever heard that term before? Book it. Whatever means it takes for you to get away from idolatry the fastest. Flee. Run. You know, idolatry is an abomination to God. And imagine God, our Father, caring for you and you, you're within reach and he's just like, and all you're doing, I'm saying you, I, I don't mean anybody specific, but all you're doing is, is hiding yourself, separating yourself. So when sin occurs, sometimes things happen and we feel like God is away from us. Sometimes we blame God and we push him away. And, and we're like, where are you, God? Well, God's, he never moved. <laughs> he's in the same spot, isn't he? Who's moving then? Not him, it's me. It's me. And imagine the frustration he must feel when, when, the, when the problem, the re resolution of the issues are right there within your grasp and stubbornly we keep ourselves separated. It's safe to say that most of us have been there before. Sometimes it takes a brother to pull us out of that mess. But it's an abomination. Idolatry can pollute. It still does pollute. Acts 15, 20. Somebody read Colossians 3 and 5. We'll read that in the sermon today. Yes, sir. What's idolatry? Covetousness. I don't know what that is, right? If somebody has something so bad, I, I'm willing to give it all up to obtain it. 
maybe I'm trying to find a resolution and I'm looking in the wrong places, right, to solve my problems. Let me just say this to my brothers and sisters who are in this room. It is okay to ask for help. Because it could be borderline sin not to if you need it. When I say borderline, I'm not because sin is sin. Well, I mean, that's easy, right? But what I guess what I should say is that you're dipping your toe just to check to see how hot the water is. Pride, yes. Pride goes before destruction. But you're testing the waters. If you need help, ask for it. But what do we Southerners sometimes do? <laughs> yeah, what'd you say? Suck it up, buttercup. Oh, we, we don't want to be a bother, do we? You ever felt that way? You're you're too I guess I guess that'd be a form of pride. You're too ashamed to ask. Because you simply don't want to, quote, bother people. But what are you doing? You're playing with fire, potentially. Playing with fire. Flee from that. God has provided a way to escape. How foolish it is to not accept that. Now, he's talking to these so-called members who are who are so feel who feel like well they're doing nothing wrong when they're consuming the meat, which by the way, remember it's nothing. The meat itself is nothing. It becomes something when what? You eat it around the week, right? The week know better, or you influence the week to do this. When you consume it at home, it's nothing. But if you are so haughty, knowing you know it's nothing, but you're so haughty that you're going, look what I'm doing. I'm going to the pagan temple to consume the meat. That's the problem. That's when it becomes sin. Okay? And that's what, that's what happens here beginning in verse 15. Some sarcasm here too by the way. I speak as to wise men. <laughs> judge ye what I say. You judge what I say. Judge for yourselves what I say. Far from complimenting them on their wisdom. He's not, they're not, he's not saying you're wise. He's making fun of them. He's rebuking them. For their phenomenal spiritual density. Look how good you are. You think you're so... Christian, that you can go into a pagan temple to eat meat, that nothing will ever happen to you. Remember what he said in verse 12? Take heed, therefore, do you think that you stand? What does he say? Take heed, lest what? Lest you fall. You're going into the temple. You judge for yourself. This, these knowledgeable Corinthians were so haughty, they were going inside these pagan temples to consume the meat, and then they were criticizing the weak brethren about it. So they're boasting about their liberty here. I'm kind of going into a whole other section, and I, I really don't want to... There's so much to say here. Anybody else have any comments about what we've talked about between verses 1 and 14? Very good. Keep keep your out of keep yourself out of situations where temptation is inevitable. Does that make sense? Right? Like if you go into a specific place and you know that you're going to be tempted right there, change the scenario. Because again, you're 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 playing with with fire, and we don't want to do that. 
All right. Any other comments or questions? seems that a lot of people that I've talked to in the past, they make a confusion between temptations, which form out of the, 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 your own desires, and circumstances. Mm -hmm. Circumstances can befall a person, which could lead to temptation to turn away from God. Yeah. But there is a difference between your temptation and your... And I say this because a lot of people have told me what, what you said about... Uh, God will never give you more than you can handle. Mm -hmm. And so then people experience circuit. You know, a loved one dies or they lose a job and they say, well, see, that's not true because I couldn't handle that. Right. And uh, But there is a difference here between he's not talking about that. He's talking about temptation. Temptation in general. Very good. Yes. That's we all deal with that. Mm-hmm. Circumstance, temptations, trials, everybody. It's common to everybody. Nobody's immune to it. Is that kind of... Right. We're putting ourselves on a pedestal, which is why it's idolatry. When we say, well, I'm the only one going through this, or why me, of all people, you know, we're putting ourselves up here. We are all on the same playing field. Okay. Does that make sense, Dave? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think Amy's saying that, like, just because I lose a loved one, it's not tempting me to sin. Right. Like, that God, not, that's not a giving me more than I can handle and causing me to sin. Mm -hmm. But that's what people say, you know, like, oh, well, I have all these bad circumstances happen to me, but that's not temptation. But that, if I say that in itself, and I say, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad, and then I say, well, I can go and do X, Y, Z, sin. Mm -hmm. But, like, just because you lose a loved one doesn't mean that can be the same. That's right. God's rooting for us. Absolutely. Very good. Good stuff. Good stuff. Thank y'all so much. I got buzzed.
Uh, the first song this morning will be number 377. Number th all three verses of number 377, I love to tell a story. Uh, we'll sing this song, then we'll have a scripture reading by Cole Doggett and our opening prayer by Ben Rabelsky. and His glory, of Jesus and His love, I love to tell the story, because I know it is true, it satisfies my love. As nothing else can do, I love to tell a story to be my theme and glory to tell the old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story. It is pleasant to read. What seems inside my tell it? Oh, wonderful be sweet. I love to tell a story, for some have never heard the message of salvation from God's unholy word. I love to tell. The story will be my theme and glory to tell the old story of Jesus and His love. I love to tell the story for the Lord. Our scripture reading this morning comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll be reading verses 51 through 58. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must be put on immortality. When the perishable puts, puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortal, then, then shall 
Come to pass the saying what is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks to be God, who gives us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for everything you've given us, everything you've blessed us with. And please be with us throughout the week, and please keep us safe as we return to school, work, and other places. And please be with everyone. And thank you for letting us come out on this wonderful Sunday and learn more about your word and to celebrate with family and friends and just to fellowship with other people like us. Please be with us throughout the week and please help us to just be the best example of your son as we can be. And thank you for sending him to down the cross for our sins. In your name we pray. Amen. Number 44. Number, no, number, excuse me, number 44. Blessed be the name. We will sing all three verses of this song. <coughs> all praise to him who reigns above in majesty supreme, who gave his son for man to die, the divine memory. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. His name above all names shall stand, exalted more and more. God the Father's own right hand, where angel hosts adore. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, Redeemer, Savior, Friend of man, one through and by the fall, Thou hast divine salvation's plan, for Thou hast died for all. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. You're marking your song books. The invitation song this morning will be number 461. 461. Song before our lesson this morning will be number 787. 787. We'll sing the first three verses and then the refrain after the third verse. If you would, please stand before our lesson. <laughs> Let's start at the beginning of the course. Uh, chorus. There you go. Up uh, from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph or so. He arose the victor from the dark domain and he 
lives forever in the saints who reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ the Lord. They weep, they watch his hand, Jesus my Savior. I'm going to begin this sermon making a plain, simple statement. I don't care what anyone on this earth declares. I don't care. Today is not the transgender day of visibility. Today is Sunday. And that means... It is the Lord's day. Many in the religious world will celebrate today as our Lord's resurrection. I'm actually encouraged to see things posted like He is risen. Because that is a fact. He is risen. For some reason, man appoints a day, one day a year, and he points it as a day of celebration, and they call it Easter. Well, that is important. He he did arose. He is risen. The resurrection is very important because it establishes that Jesus is the Son of God. He is. It proves his deity. It sets him on David's throne. It ensures his exaltation. But friends, here it is also. His resurrection provides hope for you and me. Hope of eternal life. When our Lord, when our Lord returns... All of us, whether we've done good, whether we've done bad, we will all be resurrected. We're all going to be changed. When our Lord returns, death swallowed up, our enemies destroyed. But until then, you and I, listen, are you listening? Please listen. You and I 
must. That is, it is imperative. We must be raised with Christ. If you have your Bibles with you, we are going to observe Colossians chapter 3. And we are going to look and discuss what it means to be risen with Christ. And if as we observe this chapter, we're going to notice some things. And the first thing we're going to notice are some motivations. Why we need to be risen with Christ. And the first thing. Right off the bat in chapter 3, verse 1, it's because of His resurrection. If you look at this, the first part of verse 1, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. And I want you to notice in that verse, if ye then be risen with Christ, Christ, that's past tense. American Standard has, if you were raised together with Christ. And then the English Standard says, if and then you have been raised, past tense, with Christ. Now, let's discuss what that means. In order for something to be risen, something must have died. And he speaks, if you then be what? Risen, something must have died. He says, risen with Christ. Friends, I'm going to tell you this right now. Go ahead, if you mark in your Bibles, underline that first phrase. If you then be risen, because this right here, with Christ. Oh, that's so significant. I want to be with him, so I need to rise or raise with him. What does that mean? Look at verse 12 in the previous chapter. It says, buried, and here's that phrase again, buried with him. And if I stop reading there, there's no meaning because we need to know some more about this. Look, Buried with him in what? Underline that phrase. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. I'm raised with him. Before that, I'm buried with him in what? Baptism. And yet, some will tell you today, and really defend this strongly, baptism is not essential for salvation. But let's look at this carefully. We are buried with Him in baptism. Verse 1, chapter 3, If then you be risen with Him, the only way for you and me to be risen with Christ, the only way, is through baptism. You read it for yourself. If you reason with the Scriptures, what does that tell us? That baptism is, in fact, essential for salvation. When we arise, we are a new creature, 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. And so we have a new position to enjoy with Christ. His resurrection is one of my motivations to be risen with Him. The next one is His reign. The last part of that verse there, He says, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. And now notice 
the present tense because he's sitting there still right now. He is king, and if he is king, therefore he has a what? A kingdom. Present tense. Jesus is sitting on the right hand of God of heaven. And this is where he is the head of the church. Ephesians 1, 21 and 22. And because of that, what should be sought? He says, seek things that are above. If you are risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Seek those teachings. Seek his wisdom and follow him. Why? Because his word shall never pass away. 1 John 2 and 17, the world passes away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of the Father abideth by him or abideth forever. I want to abide forever. How about you? Well, if I want to abide forever, I must do the will of the Father. And so here's the question. He is risen. He is ruling on David's throne right now. Spiritual throne. Reigning on us. The question is, is are we allowing him to reign? See, we have a choice in the matter. He's king to everybody, whether we believe him or not. But you and I have a choice to follow him. Is he reigning in your life? Look at verse 2. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Who has your affections? Who has your heart? Is it on things above or is it on things of the earth? It's You have the choice in the matter. Notice here. For you are... Present tense again. You are dead and your life is hid with who? Christ in God. They were risen, therefore something had to be dead. What do we do with our dead? We bury them, right? You are dead now. A little bit further, a little bit more on that further in the in the chapter. So we have his resurrection. I'm, I want to be risen with Christ because he arose, therefore giving me the possibility to, to raise with him. He is now king. I could choose to follow him. But here's another motivation. Look at verse 4. His return. When Christ... Who is our life? I like that. If you highlight or write in your Bible, highlight that right there. We often hear and even say, and I say this, Christ must be first in my life. No, He is my life. Nothing comes even close to second place. Sometimes we say that, you know. Christ is first in my life, but a close second is whatever, fill in the blank. No, He is our life. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with Him. There's that phrase again. Where? In glory. Not on earth, but in glory. Notice the present tense. All will be resurrected. Our Lord said this, John 5, 28, 29. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life. Guess what, though? They that have done evil unto the resurrection of condemnation. Remember I said earlier that when he shall appear, present tense, it is an inevitable event which should motivate everyone to want to be risen with Christ. This is going to happen. He will shout, 
All the graves will open. Everyone will be resurrected. Those who've done good, eternal life. Those who've done evil, eternal condemnation. Again, we have a choice in the matter. There's my motivations. He arose. He is king. He's reigning right now. And he will return. Resurrection, reign, return. Now let's look at some exhortations. Number one, verse five, mortify. That's number one. Mortify, therefore. Mortify, necro-o, means to deaden or be dead. Since you know your position, since those in Colossae, you know you were raised with him, and now you have a position of joy with Christ. Since you know that, by the way, we can't know. Let's practice the following. Mortify. Mortify what? Let's keep reading. Mortify, mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience, in the which you also walk sometime when you lived in them. I want you to notice some things there in verse 7. Walked lived. What tense is that? It's past, isn't it? Another past tense. Mortify those things, the works of the flesh. See, this is what we discussed in Bible class. Even though we are in our new positions with Christ, we are risen with Christ. When we come out of the watery graves of baptism, we arose. We are a new creature. We are in our new positions Friends, we can still be tempted and fall away. This is a warning. Paul is writing to Christians right here. And he's telling them to mortify the works of the flesh. That is in your old life. That person is dead and you buried him. Next is the ways of the flesh. Look at verse 8. But now, present tense, but now you also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Friends, this is the way we feel. A lot of people in the world rely on their feelings. The problem is, is our feelings can fool us. They can lie to us. I can feel good about something, but can be completely wrong about something, right? So the ways of the flesh, the words of the flesh, we've got evil communication here. Look at it. Filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not. Don't tell stories. I don't like that word stories, by the way. It just softens the blow. It's lie. Lie not one to another, seeing that you've put off the old man with his deeds. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Friends, whatever we put in our minds stays there. Even after we've been risen with Christ, our lives beforehand is still right here. Whatever we put in our hearts, our brains, our minds, it stays there. It never goes away. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if one does not put to death the works and the ways of the flesh, he's going to have problems with words of the flesh. And if we don't mortify well, look at verse 6. For which things sake the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience. So these things should be in our past. Verse 7, walked, lived, but now in a new position. 
Verse 9, lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. Mortify, also magnify. Verse 10, we want to conform, we want to be like Christ. And we need to magnify that. Magnify that desire. Look at verse 10. And have put on the new man. This is the new creature we were talking about earlier. This is the new man that's risen with Christ. We have put on the new man, which is renewed in, notice, knowledge after the image of him that created him. Jesus is now the pattern of this man's life. He wants to be like Christ. And then the maturity. Look at verse 11, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ, notice, is all and in all. That means all of us are equal. It doesn't matter how poor we are or rich we are. It doesn't matter where we come from. It doesn't matter the color of our skin. At the foot of the cross, we are all evil. All equal, not evil. Equal. <laughs> Sometimes my mouth goes faster than my brain. We're all equal, aren't we? In the grave, we're all equal, right? Absolutely. And so we magnify this. We magnify wanting to be more like Christ. We magnify uh, our maturity in Christ. We're, 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 we're no longer thinking immature, immaturely. Is that even a word? We're being mature about our thoughts. And then our dependency. Look at um, verse 11 again. Christ is all and in all. Christ is all we need. He's all that we need. His teachings, His love, which He manifests, His sacrifice. He is sufficient. What's Philippians 4.13 say? What does Paul say there? I can do all things through Christ, which what? You know the verse. I can through Christ. And then I multiply a life, a sensitive life. Look at verse 12. Put on, I'm a new man now. I've, I've been risen with Christ. I'm, I've put to death those other things. Now I'm going to put on, I'm going to grow A sensitive light. Look at verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering. I'm going to be sensitive to the needs of other people. Why? Because I realize their struggle. Also, why? Because I need these things. I need people to be long-suffering towards me. I need people to be kind to me. I need people to realize that I also struggle. And be merciful unto me. It's really easy to be merciful unto someone who is merciful themselves, right? It's hard to be merciful to somebody who is not merciful. Who doesn't show mercy? And so if, I, if I'm sensitive to the needs of others, I'm going to promote selflessness. Look at 13 and 14. Forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on... If you have King James, it says charity. But what's charity mean? Love. Which is the bond. It's the glue of completeness. It's the glue. 
when I have those virtues in, in, in verse 12, I'm not going to have any problems with dwelling with other people. And yeah, we fight. We're human, right? We fight. We argue. We say things we don't mean. There's misunderstandings. But we learn to dwell together because love is the glue. And if I if I strive to be selfless and I think about other people, I'm going to live a peaceful life. Look at verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also you were called in, underline this please, one body and be thankful. Tranquility is peace and I'm going to let God rule in my heart. I'm going to let His Word rule. I'm going to let it govern me. I want to let His Word give me the order. I'm His soldier. And if I allow Jesus to rule, I, there's not going to be any discontentment. There will not be any disorder. Problems come from not letting His Word in my heart. And I try it my own way. Have you been there before? Have you tried it your own way? How did that work out for you? There's a better way. And then I become spiritual. Look at verse 16 here. Look. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Friends, we can know the book. We can have it memorized from cover to cover. But if I don't apply his word in my life, there's no wisdom in that. That's foolishness. God's saying, well, here's the way to eternal life. Yeah, I'm going to go that way. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So God, His word, worship will thrive in our lives. It will thrive in our minds. There's no better time or place than in worship to God. Did you hear me? There's no better time and place than right here, right now. And where are you? That spiritual life, His Word, if it's dwelling in me, that's going to promote a life of service. If you look at verse 17, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. I'm going to quickly go through my third point because I know you're going to get the picture here. If we read through the rest of the chapter and we have these virtues in our mind, these exhortations of how we should be, everything else falls into place. I want you to look at it. First, he deals with things in the home. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it, is, as it is fit in the Lord. Every time you see that phrase, underline it. As it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. You want your wife to be submissive? You must love her. You don't tell her you have to. You, wa you want to make it to where she wants to because it's fitting in the Lord. You do your part in that. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is, underline it, 
well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers. Don't get up and work when you see the boss coming. Work anyway because you love but in singleness of heart, fearing God. There it is, underline that. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily. As to the Lord, there it is, and not unto men, knowing that of the day you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. But he that does wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. And there's no respect of persons. This affects everybody. Nobody gets an out. But there's motivations here, right? There's motivations. He has resurrected. He has risen. He is reigning. And He will return. It's inevitable. And that motivates me to magnify, to multiply, to do what I can to be His servant the best I can. And apply all of those things in my life. Friends, your life will be better. I didn't say it'll be easier, but it will be better. Our Lord's resurrection gives us hope. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that day. I, I'm one who prays, Lord, come quickly. Are you? And if you're not, what's, what's the deal? Heaven is far better. It's far better. He's the Son of God. Heaven is far better. And He wants you to be there. That's why He came here and died for you. And He's sitting on His throne reigning. And so we must be risen with Christ. Keep off the old self. Don't let Him come back. You buried Him in baptism. Keep on the new self when you arose out of the watery grave. And when we do that, friends, we can live a life of peace, hope, and joy. But more importantly, God gets the glory. So what say you today? He loves you. This proves it. This is our God. Not the Pope. Not the President of the United States. But our God. Our Lord, we obey Him. Our faith comes by hearing this Word. That means I can open this book. And He tells me what He wants me to do to be pleasing to Him. And He gives me the motivation to be pleasing with Him. I love Him, not because I just say, oh, I love you. No, He loved me first. And so I'm motivated to repent, confess Jesus as the Son of God. I'm motivated to to get in the water. Romans 6, 3 and 4 tells us that's how we come in contact with the blood of Christ. Friends, you know that. The blood is what washes away our sins, not the water, but He tells us how to come in contact with that blood. It's through baptism. That's the only way, the only way. But we rise up, we are raised with Him, and we continue the good fight. Are you still fighting? Are you a child of God? You can become one today, and we want to motivate you to do so. Brother Kale has a song of encouragement, and while we stand and sing, come and talk to me. There's a great day coming, a great day coming. There's a great day coming by and by. With the saints and the sinners shall be parted right in the are you ready for that day to come? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? Coming, the bright day coming, there's a bright day coming by and by. But it's brightness 
shall only come to the name of the Lord. Are you ready for the day to come? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? A sad day coming, there's a sad day coming by and by. When the sinner shall hear his living heart, I know ye not. Are you ready for that day to come? Are you ready? Are you ready? Brother Ronnie Britton has responded to the Lord's invitation and he gave me this note. And he says, I feel like I have not set a good example and I feel like I have let my family down. And he says, keep me in your prayers. Well, I can go ahead and say this. He set a great example to all of us today, hasn't he? He's allowed God's word to prick his heart to make sure that he is right with him. And that is the most important thing, right? He is very concerned about Christ reigning in his life. And I can go ahead and tell you personally that I wouldn't be standing right here right now if it wasn't for him. I love Ron. I'm thankful for him. Will you pray with me? Our gracious Father in heaven, you were just awesome. We've done nothing to deserve all that you've given us. And without you, we are nothing. Your love and your mercy and your grace are just, we just can't comprehend. Your word is magnificent. And it truly does abide forever. We've been proven that many times. We're thankful that you are merciful unto us. That you always give us a chance to become your child. Father, there are many in this world who need you. And Father, we pray as Christians that we have those opportunities to bring those souls to you for a better life. Father, we come to you on behalf of Ronnie Britton, whose heart was pricked by your word, who feels like he's not been an example of what he should be as far as a child of yours. But again, you're faithful. You've told us that we come to you on his behalf and he asked for forgiveness. You're faithful and just to forgive. Thank you, Father, for forgiveness. That is our greatest need, all of us. And you've provided it. We're thankful for Jesus Christ, that sacrifice, that, that bloodshed that continues to cleanse us when we need it. And we need it all the time. And it's in his son's name that we pray. Amen. Number 103. We'll sing all three verses of 103 to prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. I gave my life for thee, my precious love. 
Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this opportunity that we have on the first day of the week to gather around this table and partake of this loaf. We ask that we take our minds back to the scene of the cross, that we might remember your, your son's body that was sacrificed on our behalf. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank <laughs> you. 
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this fruit of the vine that reminds us of the blood that Jesus shed on the cross for the forgiveness of all our sins and that it gives us a hope in heaven. In your name we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the health and abilities that you've afforded us to go out and earn a living. We ask at this time that we might set aside a portion for the upbuilding of your kingdom. We ask that you be with the eldership here at this congregation. They might use these funds uh, to the best of their ability. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Number 901, number 901, all three verses of this song, we'll sing that before our announcements this morning.
no tears in heaven, no sorrows in No tears, no tears of thirst, sorrow and pain will all have No tears, no tears, no tears of thirst, no tears in heaven will be known. Glory is waiting, waiting up yonder. Where we shall live in endless day, there with our Savior we'll be forever, where no more sorrow can dismay. No tears, no tears, no tears of their sorrow and pain will all end. No tears, no tears out there, no tears in heaven will be gone. Some morning yonder will cease to wonder where things this life has brought to you. All will be clearer, save one's Good morning. We'd like to welcome you to Fairview. Uh, if you're visiting with us, we are honored to have you with us, and we invite you to join us back at any opportunity that you may have. Uh, if you are visiting and you have filled out a visitor card or a sunshine card, we'll have two young men come by at this time to pick those up on the outside aisles. Uh, we still have uh, many on our sunshine list, so if you will, take a look at that and remember all those in your prayers. Remember Sammy Gingrich and the rest of his platoon? Uh, they're being shipped out to Bulgaria this morning. Uh, friends with Greg and Elisa Foster. So remember him uh, and all those in your prayers. Kayla Rodriguez uh, had her baby Friday. Uh, they are doing fine at this time. So uh, remember them as well. Uh, remember the Easter egg hunt. This will be Sunday, April 7th. Uh, Joey and Linda Hamby's home. Um, Lunch will be served, and the egg hunt will follow. Uh, this is for children through the fourth grade. Please bring a lawn chair um, and any outdoor activities you'd like to bring. Um, please sign up by tonight if you plan to attend. Uh, even if you don't have children participating and plan to come, please sign the list. Field eggs need to be returned by Wednesday night. Please turn in around 10 pictures of your choice to Brandon Greaves for the senior uh, slideshow as soon as possible. I'm sure he would prefer digital high res uh, photos. This is for high school and college. Our dinner and recognition is April 28th after morning services. I have a, a, a note here to read. Thank you so much to all the ladies who donated snacks and drinks to our lads group this weekend. A special thank you to our shepherds for supporting this program and to all the adults who poured their many talents, their time, and their knowledge into our kids over the last year. Lads is truly a congregation program, not just our youth. We had a great time at convention with over 
9,200 other members of the Lord's Church. We had 19 kids competing in art, speech, oral Bible reading, song reading for boys, and songs of praise for girls. These kids also participated in year-round events along with about 12 other Fairview kids. Olivia Greaves placed second in songs of praise. Liam Greaves was a finalist in song leading. Cole Doggett placed second place in speech. Hannah Clay Doggett placed first in songs of praise. And Brody Fisher was a Bible Bible Bowl test high scorer. All of our kids worked so hard all year, but most importantly, grew in their faith and their love for God and each other. Thank you again to all involved. Love, Jake and Leslie Hamby. Uh, we had 301 present today. Uh, we're thankful for everyone here. I believe that's all I have at this time. Uh, so if you will, uh, join me in prayer. Father in heaven, we are thankful for this day that you bless us with and this life that you bless us with. Father, we come to you recognizing you as our creator, the giver of good, ever good and a perfect gift. Father, we're thankful for this day and uh, everyone that has come out here this morning to worship you. We thank for, thankful for that opportunity. And Father, we pray that everything said and done here this morning has been pleasing in your sight. Father, we Pray for those who were unable to be here this morning. We pray for those who are sick and in need of your prayers. Father, we pray that uh, we will do anything we can to help them and pray that you'll be with them. Father, we pray for those who were mentioned here this morning. Those will be mentioned at a later time. We pray that you will provide them the things that they stand in need of. Father, we thank you for Mr. Ronnie Britton and uh, his heart to come forward this morning. We pray that uh, we will... Help him in any way possible. Father, we pray for those who are serving this country. May you be with them and their families, Father. Father, we pray that you will bring us back the next point of time tonight. Pray that you will guide, guard, and direct us and forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name, amen. The members of the Fairview congregation desire to bring glory to God. We do this by living our lives to the best of our ability according to his word, serving others who are in need, and spreading the gospel throughout the community and the world.